it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Mark Clive all the way from Black Mountain, North Carolina. He earned his DDS degree with distinction from the University of Minnesota School of Dentistry in 1997. Mark has had the experience as an associate in a multi-clinic setting and as an owner of two different fee-for-service practices. For the last six years, Mark has practiced in a beautiful area of the country, Asheville, North Carolina. Mark is a visiting faculty member with the Panky Institute and a 2015 inductee into the American College of Dentistry. He is also a regular contributor to the Restorative Nation website. Mark has lectured at numerous state and regional dental meetings, including Hinman, Yankee, Texas, Minnesota, California, Florida, and the ADA's annual session. He also teaches a financial management courses for dentists in Black Mountain, North Carolina. How are you doing today, Mark? I am fabulous, Howard. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. You know, I asked you to be on my show, and you gratefully accepted. You didn't ask me, but the one thing that really piqued my interest and why I wanted to get you on this show is, sure. you know, I, I feel kind of bad because 30 years ago when I got out of school, nobody walked out of school with $350,000 of student loans. And we thought we were martyrs because we had 35000 or 50000 I had a, you know, my mom and dad never gave me a dime to go to college because my dad said, if I pay for your dental school, you'll just go there and drink beer and you won't pay attention. You need to be a self-made man. And I pouted, you know, about my student loan debt. But what what do you say to kids who come out with three hundred and fifty thousand dollars in student loans? Um, I, mean, I think students. I think students today um, have to be prudent. Um, I, you know, I've heard in previous podcasts before you talking about people that come out. They're they're they've now been um, kind of christened a dentist. And, you know, the first thing that they want to do is live a dentist lifestyle, which is, you know, buy the BMW and um, live in a big house and start paying lots of real estate taxes. Um, I think today um, students need to be more prudent than ever. Um, we, you know, the, the, the thought process that I have is students today have to um, quickly learn to live on less than they make. Because the, the thought process with student debt is it's going to take time. Dentistry is a fabulous career. Be, um, be very uh, disciplined with where you decide you want to practice and in what environments you want to practice in. But, um, you know, dentistry is a fabulous career, and yet you, you have to be prudent. Um, you know, as you've stated before, it's like somebody just gave you a credit card balance that says, you know, you got $315,000. You know, you've, you've just got to be careful with that. You know, it's kind of a disease because I notice um, if I stop exercise, you know, exercise leads to mental health. When you stop exercising, yeah. your mental health kind of goes down and then you start eating crappy. But I notice yeah. it's a double I do the same thing. I do the same thing. When you, when you exercise a lot, you, you're more mentally healthy jacked and then you're more disciplined to say no to all the carbs. Same thing with spending. The, the dental students that come out and buy a big house and a, and a BMW, they, they, they now that makes them take big vacations. It makes yes. them eat out at big restaurants. It makes them big Christmas presents and big Rolex watches. It, it's a disease. But the person who comes out and lives prudent, then that prudent rolls out. Then they're like, well, instead of going on a vacation to uh, London, why don't we just go uh, take a tent to the lake? Um, and instead of eating at a five-star restaurant, why don't we go to the Waffle House? I mean, it, it's a lifestyle. It's either a spending lifestyle, which spins out of control, or a prudent lifestyle, as you're saying. I like, I've never heard anyone say, Christian does a dentist. That is, I love it. Once you're Christian. Well, and, and, I mean, if you, if you look at statistics, um, the statistics that I have read state that the um, average American – or the percentage of average, average Americans that continue to live the lifestyle at retirement that they're used to is 3%. Now, dentists, dentists have way higher um, income potential over time. Do you know what the percentage is? What? 5%. 5% of dentists, based upon statistics, can live the lifestyle that they have into retirement. So if, if the goal is that you know, I want to have a nice, even lifestyle and I want to do this over a long period of time, then I'm going to need to, again, um, learn, learn to be prudent in, in what I have. And probably that never became clear to me 
than when I read the book, The Millionaire Next Door. I was just thinking the same thing, The mil- by, written by two PhDs. Yes, yes. And basically what they say is that, that um, people that, that, that amass money and save money over time, they're, the, we're getting beat by the plumbers. We're getting beat by the electricians. We're getting beat by you know, people in the trades because they don't have a lot to do to try and keep up with the Joneses. Um, dentists, if they're trying to keep up with their neighbors or their, you know, um, the guys down the street who's a dentist or an oral surgeon or an orthodontist or, or a physician or whatever it is, um, you got a big task ahead of you. You can't, you can't, um, the most you can't spend your way into affluence. That's, that's for sure. I love that. You can't spend your way into affluence. You know, the most mind blowing thing of that, that book, you know, it was humans hate inconvenient facts and here it was what profession had the highest percentage of millionaires at retirement and it was school teachers because when yes. you become a school yes. teacher you know you're poor you're definitely <laughs> lower middle class so they buy smaller homes and keep them yes. the rest of their life and retire and they pay them off and sam they 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 do their their savings and and so they're just i'm a poor teacher so i'm not going to expensive restaurants and vacations yes. and i'm not getting a big diamond ring and a rolex watch and and since they're teachers they don't spend and they have the they had the highest percentage of millionaires at age 65 yes. just crazy yes. so you always yes. talk about your five hurdles um on um for Dennis and number one is what we're talking about. People spend too much money. Um, yeah. What, 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 so what, what would you say uh, to a millennial driving to uh, their corporate associate job right now with $350,000 of student loans? Um, you know, there's a quote out there that says you can be the greatest investor ever, but if you can't save money, you're doomed. Um, so if your thought process is, I want to save money and I want to build wealth and wealth accumulation, then you have to understand um, that your first discipline, the first hurdle that you have to cross is you got to learn to live on less than you make. And you, and, and for um, the younger dentists, I think, I mean, it was a turning point for me. Um, I came out of dental school in 1997. I took a uh, first course at the Pankey Institute in 1998. Now this course could have been, any other place in the country. It just happened to be where it was. And, um, but one of the things that became clear to me was I didn't have a, a good understanding of finance. I mean, I grew up in a family. My dad was a welder. My mother was a nurse's aide. There were six kids in my family. Um, so you have, you, know, to be, you have to be, that means you have to be Catholic or Mormon if you have six kids. It was, it was Catholic. Good, See, good I dad. know my homies. And yeah. you, so your dad was a welder and your mom was what? A nurse's aide. Nice. My oldest son is a welder. Um, it's a fabulous trade. Even today, it's a fabulous trade. Well, you, you know, you know what uh, his special niche is? Why he uh, loves it? He, his favorite hobby was rock climbing. And then he found out that in welding, uh, everybody wants to stand on the ground when they weld. And the rarest thing right. was who will climb up, up a thousand square, a thousand foot cell phone tower and weld a new platform to switch out a new Verizon box. And nine out of 10 people who apply for the job after they get about 30 feet up, they go, screw this. I'm standing on the ground. I want to weld a pipe, something on the ground. So he climbs, he, he climbs a thousand feet with a welder and a Verizon box on his deal. And, but anyway, so and he's shout well out to all the welders. Well, and, and so, the, you know, the thought process was, I, I mean, I didn't, in our family, we didn't talk about money. We all, almost never. It wasn't until um, I started dating my eventual wife and going to Thanksgiving dinner at her house that everybody in her family, like your father who owns Sonic Restaurants, everybody in her family was in business and they talked about money openly. And, and um, at, you know, I left Thanksgiving dinner and the first thing I told my wife when we were driving home was, oh my gosh, all they talk about is money. It was, it was totally different. But one of the things that I learned um, early was, and that I think your listeners need to understand too, is that, that the cost of capital is different when you own a business versus when you don't own a business. The, um, the cost of capital for business loan is different than for personal debt. So, um, you know, if you're out there trying to prioritize, well, I've got this much in credit card debt and this much in personal debt and this much in student loans and this much in business debt. Um, if you don't realize that there is an actual simple formula out there to determine what that is, 
um, you know, it, it can be hard to figure out what, what do I want to start paying off first? So, um, you know, that formula, the stated cost times one minus your tax rate gives you some indication of, of what your business loans, because they're deductible, what, what they actually are going to cost you. So if you use it as an example, if you use um, the stated cost as 10%, let's say you have a, a business loan today for your dental office at 10% and your tax rate, your current tax rate is 35%. You take one minus the 35% and you get 0.65 is the actual cost. So you take 6.65 times that by 10 and your actual interest rate on your business loan is 6.5%. Um, so that, I mean, that was, it was just an example of not having, not coming out of school with any real knowledge on finance. That's what I would tell young people today is learn to live on less than you make. Hurdle number one is learn to live on less than you make and understand the cost of capital, understand the cost of the debt that you have, because I think it, it makes it easier and clearer to understand um, what you're going to pay off first and, and how you're going to prioritize your debts. You know, I, there's two dental schools. I, I, I live and practice in Phoenix, Arizona, and we have two dental right. schools in a suburb. One on the west side is um, Midwestern in Glendale, Arizona, right. and the one on the right side is uh, AT Still in uh, Mesa. And I see these kids come out of school, three hundred fifty, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 in debt, and yeah. they're born and raised in this town. Their parents live there, and they don't even want to go move in with their parents, and then they go out and buy a $350,000 house. I'm like, yeah. dude, why didn't you go back home and live with your parents? I go, dude, I'm a doctor. And they're driving a BMW and they're in a three yeah. and, and, and they complain about their student loan debt. This blows my mind. They complain about their $350,000 student loan debt, but they're working at a corporate dental chain. And then they go yes. buy a $350,000 house and they're still an employee as an associate dentist. What, what do you think about that when you have student loan debts and you buy a house before you buy a dental office? Well, I, you know, the, the um, you know, I guess in my own personal story that I did buy a house in 1997, I was an associate dentist. I did buy a house in 1997 before I bought a dental practice. My first dental practice I bought in 2000. So I did the same thing, but I suppose if I sent you a picture of my house, you would realize that even not today, 20 some years later is that house worth 350,000. I think it was 126,000 or something like that in, in 1997. So, you know, if you, if you were to look at, at, um, you know, your, your total cost of living expenses and those sorts of things, I mean, I was, I was fortunate in that, um, that I married well from the standpoint that I married someone that had a, um, you know, had a had a value for money and a value for saving money and a, and a value for not living beyond our means. When I first met her, she had a fancy sports car and she drove that fancy sports car for 13 years. So um, before we had our first children, so um, you know, it's just I, I I get the impact and I get the idea of wanting to keep up with the Joneses, but keeping up with the Joneses has some that has some liabilities long term and. Um, I, I, at some point you have to look at your net worth statement. If your net worth statement just has a bunch of, as a negative with a whole bunch of zeros behind it, um, I, I just, it, I think it, it, um, it cramps motivation sometimes. I've seen this in dentists and, and employees over the last 30 years and friends. If, if you're a spender and you marry a spender, oh my God, that, that, that marriage, everything's in a crash and burn if you're a spender and you marry a saver, there's a lot of conflict, but it helps. But man, when a saver marries a saver, oh my God, is that just bliss. And you also see the employees because some employees, every time their bank's drafts overdrawn, every time their financial insanity, they're always it's following chaos. you into your private office wanting more money, yes. more money, more money. Yes. And then the savers are on cruise control. They're not stressed. You no, know, the you know, if they bring it up, it'll only be during their yearly uh, employee uh, annual. Uh, you know, we, we have our annual in our HR department, our annual employee review, and it's all formal and it's all written up in notes and everything. The savers only talk about money during that one time annual review. But if some hygienist assistant receptionist follows you in your private office, they're probably a spender. 
and they're probably married to a spender, and that's just the disease, isn't it? And, and every and every decision is based upon well, what's the monthly payment? So they know exactly what they make per month, but every single item that is purchased, this is my experience, and and with team members the same in the same way is that any any experience. For the, for the spenders, it's all based upon, well, what's the monthly payment? So as long as I can get that monthly payment on that car down and string it out for eight years, I'm, you know, I get to drive a new car. And um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a liability long term. It's a liability long term. Well, your five hurdles. Hurdle one was you spend too much money and you got you to, gotta, uh, no one spent their way uh, to affluence. You got you to gotta spend less than you earn. You got to be a saver. But number two, hurdle number two says we need an accurate understanding of finance. We can control risk, cost, and time. What do you mean by that? And if she's driving to work right now listening to you saying, dude, I got an A in chemistry and trig and geometry and biochem, and I can tell you the Krebs cycle, but how the hell do I learn finance? What would you say to her? Well, there's, um, I think finance is, is um, it's in the marketplace, and the messages always make it incredibly confusing. Um, but the reality is that um, – Finance can be incredibly simple. And so, you know, if, if I have a DDS and I had thousands of hours of education and I come out and I think that, that um, I can't, um, I'm not smart enough to manage um, what I need to do to understand finance, I think that's completely wrong. I think there is lots of, of fantastic education out there that can be read in a couple of simple books. Um, but, you know, in reality, um, any any um, accumulation of wealth over time, you have to manage risk, you have to manage cost, and you have to manage time. Okay. So if your thought process first is, well, I'm going to stick all my money in a savings account. You know, your savings account is going to earn half of one percent, and inflation is going to be two percent over time. We don't know what the future stands, but that's in the last twenty years, that's what it's been. Um, you're going to lose money over time, so you need to understand that that stocks and bonds are the types of are the types of investment vehicles that are going to help you accumulate wealth over time. And and if you're looking at things like risk, you manage risk. If you say, you know what, I'm 100% into the stock market and I'm going to give it a go all the time, and you know I'm not, I don't need my money for 30 years. I think the the stock market's a great place to put your money. Um, if you're risk averse, then you need to look at just adjusting your portfolio so that you are going to have more, you know, um, slightly more bonds, um, uh, than a full hundred percent in stocks. And, um, you know, time, time is an amazing thing that, that, um, you know, everybody talks about compound interest. Few people understand it. Um, but compound interest, we think of, of, or I used to think of saving money and the curve being linear for my life. I'm going to save money and over my life, that curve is going to be linear. But compound interest shows us that that, um, that that linear curve changes at about 20 years. Well, I'm 20 years in as an investor. Okay. And at 20 years, you only have about 20% of the, um, if you create a goal of I'm going to have a million dollars and you save for the first 20 years, at 20 years, based upon compound interest curves, you only have 20% of the, of the total amount that you plan to have in 40 years. And over the next 20 years, that's when your money hits the compound interest parabolic part of your curve. And all of a sudden, that's where you get 80% of your, of your money. So, um, if you figure out your risk tolerance and you realize that the earlier you start investing, the better, that first 20 years, it doesn't matter whether that 20 years starts when you're 25, 35, or 45. You have an MBA in finance, Howard. You know this very well. Um, that first 20 years, that curve doesn't jump. And so you have to decide, even young dentists out there have to decide what they want for their preferred future and have to start saving because, um, you know, people talked about when I graduated from dental school, oh, save $10,000 a year. And, and by the time you're 40, you're going to have a million and a half dollars or whatever that number is. Well, the first few years of school, I couldn't manage, you know, $10,000 a year, but we started saving what we could at the time that we could do it. And it, and it worked great. 
Um, and, and lastly, so that's, that's risk. Risk is managing stocks and bonds and portfolio type stuff, and it doesn't have to be complicated. Um, time is, you know, you've got to start saving something at some point and just understand that that first 20 years, one of my mentors calls that the desert period where you think, oh my God, of it, I've been saving for 20 years, but I've only got 20% of the money that I'm hoping to have. Um, uh, the next 20 is where it really matters. And cost, well, you know, cost is, um, today I look at cost completely different. When I first um, came out of school, I talked to my mentors, who's, you know, what financial advisors did you use? Who did you talk to? And I started using some of those people and, and um, you know, I was, I was paying, you know, $6,000 a year for their advice, but I could only save $10,000. And it was like, this is just not smart. So um, I think for the first 20 years, dentists really need to think about just managing, using really low cost funds and just save, save, save. Don't let it be complicated. You know, don't let somebody talk you into like I was, um, you know, into, well, you know, your portfolio should have 30 different funds in it for, you know, diversification and stuff. And that, I just don't believe that today. I just don't believe it today. So my favorite quote on compound interest is from Albert Einstein. He says, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it earns it. He who doesn't pays it. And when you're talking about that 20 year desert period, well, let's just take the reverse of it. You know, if you don't understand something, just flip it around and what's the reverse. So when you buy a $100,000 mortgage for 30 years on a house, the, the first six, the first seven years, it's basically interest only. Your, your $1,000 payment would be like $990 interest and $10 yes. of debt reduction. Yes. And then yes. you don't really pay off the house to the end. And yes. same thing with savings. So that first, um, the opposite, the first is all principal, almost no interest. Yes. And yes. then by the time you get to the end, it's all interest. It's no principal. I mean, I mean, um, and there, there's two types of people. I mean, I mean, you take these dentists. I mean, it is absolutely insane. They'll be they'll be 50 years old and buy a new mansion on a 30 year loan. I'm like, dude, you're 50. Really? You're going to do. You're, and so you're either paying interest on other people's money or you're earning interest on other people's money. And to get from the side of, I'm paying, you know, I, I, I impulsively have to have my car today, so I'm gonna buy it today and finance it for 60 months. I have to have my house today. I, I can't afford the 15 year payment, so I'm gonna get the 30 year. It's always, it's an impulse control dysfunction. It's instant gratification. And you even and, find- and purchases And purchases made on a monthly payment model. Like, oh, this is how much I make. This is how much I can pay per month. So therefore, I can take this and go to my real estate agent and say, this is what I can afford. And then Warren Buffett's, uh, you know, Warren Buffett is the outside man, but there's an inside man, Charlie Munger, who's been his, you know, they've been Batman and Robin the whole time. So Warren Buffett gets all the show because he's like that. Um, you know, I went to Creighton in Omaha. I, you know, uh, he's, yes. he's just a great yes. man. But Dad his buddy... Flexors. His buddy, right. Charlie Munger, says, understanding both the power of compound interest and the difficulty of getting it is the heart and soul of understanding a lot of things. Well, and the, the uh, you know, and, and along with compound interest, the um, I kind of uh, think about this from hurdle number five and we'll get there. But but as, as long as we brought it up, that, that that there's all kinds of discussion about compound interest and. Um, but few people talk about the, the compounding of fees when it comes to, you know, investment, mutual funds and those sorts of things. And, but we'll, we'll get to that part. But, uh, you know, Warren Buffett is um, I, his, you know, his passion has always been keeping things simple, keeping costs low. I mean, he he um, just this year, he had a fantastic shout out to John Vogel, who was the founder of Vanguard, saying, you know, here's a person that is um, done a lot more for the financial industry in his 80 some years than than the next five people added together. Um, you know, his he, Warren Buffett was a frugal person and and 
And he still lives, less than he his still lives in his starter home. I, I, I drove by in, in uh, at Creighton, and he lectured at our business school at Creighton University. And another, another thing he said is compound interest. He said, "What this is what Warren Buffett said. What you have become is the price you paid to get what you used to want. <laughs> yes. You're still paying yes. today on something that you wanted a long time ago. Well, and that's that, you know, you, you know, you use the term instant gratification, but but at, at some point you have to decide what your prefu- preferred future is going to be and then be disciplined enough to get there. I mean, it, and it, it takes time. And, and, you know, again, in investing, um, you've you've got to um, you've got to be in it for the long haul and you've you've just got to be disciplined for a long time. Hurdle number three, you say we must learn the history of finance. There is no success in timing the market. Well, you know, I, I kind of chuckle because um, this is a hurdle that I um, tripped over in in 2009 um, quite nicely. You know, um, a person like yourself remembers the roaring 80s where the market went from, you know, 2000 to 16,000. Um, you know, I was, you know, investing from you know, 1998 or 99 and on. Um, but, you know, the, in 2007, the market got to 16,000. And then in two years, you know, a year and a half dropped to 8,500. And nearly at the bottom, I personally like panicked and pulled my money out. And I said, this, this, whole, this whole market thing isn't for me. And I, you know, I waited, I, kept reading about, you know, it's, the market hasn't hit its bottom yet and all that sort of stuff. Well, around about 2010, I got back in and my own personal portfolio lost about 28%. And um, the greatest part of this story was that that my wife had her own funds and she was doing her own thing with her stuff. And of course, she never, it never, never even crossed her mind to pull her money out. And so, and she had more money in her funds than I had in my funds. So the good news was I lost 28%. She didn't lose anything she gained. She was constantly putting money into the market at the low periods. And so as a family, we were successful, Howard. I mean, that's a, that's the great American story is when your wife um, is a better investor than you are. Um, but, you know, there's, there's plenty of people and there's plenty of media saying, you know, you just pick up a Time magazine or a Money magazine and go back and look at what they were saying two years ago. And most of it is complete dribble. And and um, there is not a wise investing mind like Warren Buffett or John Bogle or William Bernstein that say that there's any success in timing the market. And the examples that they show of people who have done it year and year and year again, um, they got to one point and within one year or two years, they lost all the gains that they, you know, because they felt they were, they were doing better than the market. So I think there's, um, John Bogle says, don't do something, just stand there instead of don't stand there, do something. Um, you know, the, I think that, that the advice that I would give people is that, um, just continue being an investor. Don't think that that somebody that you hire or somebody that you read from that says, well, I think the market's going to tank or I, you know, there were plenty of people that in the election that said, oh, I'm taking my money off the table. And what what's happened to the market since the election? I mean, it's just there's there's so much noise in the marketplace. There's so much noise in the media about you know, well, you know, this you're 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 at risk right now, and I think we've hit a high, and there's going to be a bump, and you know, maybe with war in North Korea, the market's going to change, and you know, there is no brilliant mind in finance that believes that any of that is true. That's that's what I read. That's what I believe. Oh yeah, when Warren talks about uh, timing the market, he says time is your friend, impulse is your enemy. Take advantage of compound interest and don't be captivated by the siren song of the market. And it's funny how yes. the richest investor in the world lives in Omaha and all the other ones try to sling it out in Manhattan, in lower Manhattan. Yes. And yes. they're all you know, thinking they're getting stock tips at the urinal or at the coffee shop or Starbucks. And Warren, here he is, $56 billion dollars. And lives in that house that he bought for a hundred thousand back in the day. It's still just a right. little brick house, 
And uh, I mean, that guy is just, uh, I mean, just, just amazing. And he, uh, does, and he, and he, as a business model, a business model for Berkshire, he doesn't time the market. He doesn't, I mean, he look, everything that he looks for in a, in his philosophy is buy and hold, save for the long term. You know, we're, there's no success in timing the market. That's, he said that over and over again. Yeah. So, um, hurdle number four, your biggest enemy is the one in the mirror. There is considerable noise in the media that we need to ignore, and we think we see patterns that don't exist. It, it's they, they really do think they see things in their Ouija board, their stars, their patterns. Yes. And the, the only pattern they should focus on is the pattern of spending less than you earn and saving. But they well, they well, want to, you know, they're they're saying, well. Well, there's a couple of statistics that are interesting. Um, one is the uh, the tongue-in-cheek statistic that says that 80% of drivers believe that they're above average drivers. Okay, um, 80% of low-cost funds beat what the advisors suggest. So um, advisors are there's there's lots of advisors that that suggest act, uh, actively managed funds. And the reality is that that um, eighty percent of those funds get beat by low cost funds that just match whatever index they're being referred to. So um, you know the biggest enemy in the mirror are those of us that believe that there's that that the random noise that's happening in the marketplace it convinces us to do things that we wouldn't normally do. Um, and you know that's what happened to me when I pulled money out of the market and. 2009, it was like, um, I thought, you know, I'm reading stuff that says that we're in trouble and that, the, you know, the, the, we're going to hit a bottom and it's going to be really big. And I pulled all my stuff out and, you know, all, all that stuff just didn't, the gloom and doom didn't come true. Um, here, you know, two and a half, three years later, the marketplace rebounded um, successfully. And all that stuff that I read was complete dribble. And, um, you know, these folks, even in the investment industry, believe that they convince themselves that they see patterns that are happening in the market. And it, it just, again, those that are in the know, um, the people that that um, that we give the most credence to, they say that's that's total dribble, total dribble. I'm just, uh, my homies are driving to work right now. To, so to help find uh, our guests, I retweet your last Twitter and you're at Mark A. Cleave. So it's Mark. Your middle name is A. What, what, what's your what's A stand for? Uh, Andrew. Andrew. Oh, are you a hurricane? <laughs> I was so, in 1992, I think. Yeah. So you're Mark A. Cleve, and Cleve is K L E I V E. What what is Cleve? Is that Scandinavian? Well, it's it's actually Clive, and it is Scandinavian. It's Norwegian. My uh, my grandfather came over on a boat. Um, he left his three older brothers behind. And a um, you know, little known fact in, in, in Norway, it's Kleiva. And, and a little known fact, it was a couple years before our, our daughters were born that my wife and I went back to the same small fishing village where my grandfather grew up. It is about five or 600 people. Um, the, the contour of the land around is just stone and grass. There's no, there's no cattle. There's no, you know, all the houses, everything. Everything was fishing industry. Um, and he was a musician and he came to the U.S. to, um, you know, play. Um, he led an orchestra and stuff. Um, he, he, uh, my grandfather died when my father was like nine years old, so I never got to meet him. But the family, uh, the Kaliva family still owns the house that my grandfather grew up in. And, and we spent, you know, 10 wonderful days with them in, the, in July, which is about 22 hours of sun. And we fish for cod out on the ocean, and and uh, so Clive is Norwegian. My God, that's cool. So your your Twitter is at Mark A Clive, and your the I just retweeted. Uh, um, um, do you realize the enormous drag that retirement fees have on your prize egg nest? The crushing, crushingly expensive mistake skills from the Atlantic. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, the when you talk about compounding interest. The difference between just you know a simple index fund with very very yes. low fees like it's from Charles yes. Schwab versus something that your employers give you. I mean, and, and they prey 
they they it's predatory on the smaller businesses, the 25 employees yes. or less, the 50 employees yes. or less. Yeah, and that's where these company. brokers make all their money is on these yes. employee pensions. And, and you're really, you're not only just screwing yourself over, but you know, I, I, I have 401k for all my, all my employees and uh, right. my gosh, uh, so many, so many small businesses like Dennis do this for their employees. And the difference between fees could be the difference between your assistant retiring at 65 a millionaire or or a hundred thousand dollars right um you know it was interesting when i when you know i spent a lot of time figuring out my team's 401k plan and um you know when i went to the to the uh, local edward jones person and said okay these are you know three different options um this is the one that i think i'm going to go with and um, when I showed it to him, he's like, there's no possible way that I can compete with this. But if, if, if your listeners, if that's the direction that they've gone, they go to their neighbor. I mean, I'm just picking on Edward Jones as an example. But if they go to their neighborhood um, investment advisor and say, I want to start a 401k plan, but they don't understand the implications of the fees or they don't bid that out in some fashion based upon knowledge, um, you know, you can end up with vastly different um, options for team members. Uh, John, John Oliver did a fantastic hey, little, uh, uh, retirement plans bit. And On it last was, week tonight. It was, uh, it was unbelievable. Um, I mean, he's a fantastic comedian, but the truth in what he was talking about was, um, you know, it's just, that's what the fifth hurdle is. The financial industry has no obligation to you. And that is that, that, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of information on truth in lending, but there's very little information on truth in investing. And as soon as, you know, John Oliver makes a point that as soon as the financial industry fights their fiduciary responsibility, I mean, they they just, you know, they've been fighting, fighting, fighting their fiduciary responsibility to, to act on our behalf. Um, and like you say, these these um, small businesses like dentistry are getting raked over the coals with regards to their fees. And, you know, the difference between if you invest for 40 years, the difference between a fund that is one percent and the fund that is that is point oh nine percent, what you're talking about, low cost fees, Howard, the difference in those expenses over 40 years is almost six hundred thousand dollars. That's what a team member would pay or a dentist would pay in those fees over time. So, you know, again, we have some understanding of what compound interest is, but we're not understanding what compound fees are. And um, and just as you say, there's a huge difference between um, providers of 401k plans out there and, you know, thus providers for dentistry. And we just have to be smart enough to go out, go out and look to see what those differences are. Yeah, and, and it, it's hard to get a grasp for numbers. I mean, even simple numbers. Like, I, I still don't think people even know the difference between a million, a billion, and a trillion. But, like, to put it in perspective, a million seconds ago was 12 days ago. A right. billion seconds ago was 32 right. years ago. A trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. I mean, it's yes. the same thing with compound interest. They don't realize their 30-year loan, the first payment is 95%. In fact, when I was in MBA school, you know what they called every loan over 24 years? Interest only. Right. So, so if you flip that around and you start spending less than you earn and you start saving, you know, that first, uh, that you know, in a, in a house, uh, any loan over 24 is interest only. The first six years is you're basically every payment is only interest. So you flip that savings account around and you start saving at 25. When you're 65, those last years, all, all your earnings is from compound interest. Right. And then right. they just well, don't get it. Well, I mean, let's let's make an analogy to a casino. Okay. So I, I've heard you talk about casinos on your podcast before. And, and if you walk into a casino, I mean, this is my understanding of what I read. I don't have like lots of experience in casino. Um, I think I'm up down like one dollar in Vegas from playing the uh, the dime slots in the airport or something like that. But um, if you the, the the house edge in a casino is somewhere between two and ten percent. Okay, so the the thought process is if you if you go to 
a casino and you think, you know, I, I have a chance of making money, there's a, you know, they have two to 11% over you, two to 10% over you right away. Um, if you, if you um, go and talk to an advisor and an advisor puts you into funds that have a certain amount of fees in them and, um, and yet you have an 80% chance of paying a higher fee, um, boy, the, the casino is actually looking pretty good then. If, if, um, if you believe you walk into a casino and are going to make money and your advisor signs you up for fees that have an 80% chance of getting beat by a low cost index fund. Um, I, I don't know. Every time that I would dip my hand into a bucket that has 80 red balls and 20 black balls, chances are I'm going to pick a red ball. And um, so, you know, I think that, that um, we need to be as dentists, as small business owners, as, as um, people that are in charge of our own wealth accumulation, our businesses aren't going to, um, you know, we're not working for Apple, we're not working for Facebook, we're not working for Google, we're in charge of our destiny. Um, we've got to be uh, prudent but with what, our... But, but, you know, they're driving around, and they, you mentioned Edward Jones. They, yeah. they, they see these these uh, on every corner. What, what, what are your thoughts yes. of Edward Jones? When, when I was little... It was basically a Merle Lynch uh, story. You know, you you drive around uh, the area and you find these little Merle Lynch. Now, now they're mostly Edward Jones. Well, what do you think of Edward Jones in 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 particular? Well, this is uncensored, right? Right. So, Hell yeah. <laughs> so um, here's my here's my beef. I think um, you're you're not going to have a fiduciary responsibility. They're not going to sign a document accepting a fiduciary responsibility. Edward Jones is known to have kickbacks in the funds and things that they recommend to other people. Um, uh, I think they can do a great job of getting um, people started that have absolutely no knowledge. But I think you still need to understand that that um, if you're paying based upon you know assets in management. Um, you're going to pay a price for that over time. And um, I, I think that in the first 20 years, let's just think about somebody who has 20 years of experience like I do. I think in the first 20 years, particularly when your net worth has a minus and a bunch of zeros after it, um, you want to try and be as prudent and low cost as possible. So why not choose incredibly low cost funds like um, Schwab target retirement funds or Vanguard target, target retirement funds and do that for 20 years. Do that for 20 years. You have an 80% chance of that being successful over anything that anybody at Edward Jones could advise for you. And, um, and my guess is that, that when you're 45 like I am and you've invested for 20 years, you can you you can decide at that point whether you want to you know go to some advisor who is going to be paid upon fees and have a fiduciary responsibility to continue to maintain things based upon your behalf. Um, that's what I think the younger uh, generation of dentists needs to be focused on. I, I I'd love to hear your opinion on Edward Jones based upon the things that you know about. Um, you you said it perfectly. I mean I mean. Somebody has to pay for your broker. Yeah. And, and that, that broker is going to get paid every two weeks for the whole time you're investing. Who's paying for your broker? And I, uh, you know, I've always been a big fan of my four finger test is, you know, if you're, if you, people come to me with dental ideas all the time. And I, and I always say, well, is it faster? Is it cheaper? Is it higher in quality? Yeah. And is it lower in yeah. cost? And I mean, what shark tank for, for one season? I mean, it's just so obvious. And, um, I, I like the fact that the only secret to lower price is lower cost. So what did Walmart do? Instead of buying through a middleman, they only bought from the manufacturer. Ba -ba -bang, ba -ba -bang. Absolutely. Uh, they, uh, and, and then when uh, they um, forced returns back on their suppliers, if a customer brought a shoe back as the heel fell off, Walmart didn't care because the guy selling me shoes is going to take it back and give me a, an exchange for free. So Walmart doesn't even have to pay for their exchanges. And if you're not going right. to exchange your shitty product, for free, I'm going to find another distributor. He just turned the tables on everyone and annihilated Sears, Walmart, Gibson's, TGY. Um, you know, uh, Southwest Airlines, you know, number one air, low cost. Why? They only fly one plane. They don't do hub and spoke. They only fly direct. Um, I think Charles Schwab is that guy. 
I, I think Charles yes. Schwab sat there and had one eye on the customer, one eye on costs, and he's used his three and a half pound walnut brain his entire career to drive down costs. So did Vanguard. Um, you know, yes. so they beat eighty percent of the and why does Warren Buffett say, you know what, for the average investor, invest invest in the S and P five hundred um, low low cost low cost funds, um, stay the course, and um, you know keep it simple. Those those were the those, those are the things that that um, I think are going to bring more wealth to your listeners than um, walking down to Edward Jones and. And saying, okay, over 40 years, I'm going to pay you, you know, nearly $600,000. So you better treat me nicely. Um, I think there's a big risk in that, Howard. And and what you just said happened to you when you were little. I, I hear from dentists all the time. Well, I went and I paid $2,500 for this investment analysis and this plan. It's like, damn, I, I did wish it. you just would have put the 2500 in an index fund and then at age 25, and you wouldn't even know what it'd be at 65. And, uh, I don't. I don't want to add up those numbers, Howard. I don't want to add up the numbers that I paid when I was younger to um, fancy CPA firm to tell me that um, I need to, you know, continue it to, to continue investing in that in that way. So, so, so you're um, you also you teach a financial management course at Panky and for dentists in Black Mountain, North Carolina. Uh, tell us about that. And and is your um, is your financial management course uh, information, uh, same on your, uh, is that blackmountaindentist.com? Is it on that? You know, that's my dental practice website. Um, I, I'm, I'm, if I, I could, um, post that through Twitter and, and, um, help people get information to that, um, to the investing course. Um, I do that with one of my mentors. Um, what? he has an MBA in finance as well. But um, he's a, also, a is it a separate Twitter? Uh, no, I, but it's, just through my, I could do it through my name or we'll figure some other way of. Well, well how do uh, my homies find out about your uh, financial management course? What would be um, the best way if they well, wanted to take it? Um, it? Well, probably the easiest thing would be to have them email me. That would be the easiest way. What's um, your email? Because I don't have it listed. It's uh, M as in Mark, all the letters of my last name, K-L-E-I-V as in Victor E at gmail.com. Mark? K L E I V E at gmail dot com. Yes, sir. So M K L E I V E at gmail dot com. Yes, sir. Yeah, I can always tell the age of a dentist when, and when he when his email is at AOL, uh, that's when you know they're uh, <laughs> over seventy. Uh, but uh, yeah, by the way, uh, baby boomers. Uh, last year, the oldest ones turned seventy. Now they're turning seventy one. And it yeah. is amazing, uh, my gosh, it's amazing how many of them are still paying interest on other people's money. Um, so tell us about your course. If they email you M Klee, which is K-L-E-I, I before E but after C in German, so that's why I know you're not a German and you're Scandinavian, because you know, lecture around the world, you really get good at name origination. But anyway, what, what's your course? Um, what, what's your course like? Is it one day, well, two days? How does that work? It's a two-day course, Howard, um, and and basically the goal of the course is to help people um, get some foundations in uh, understanding of financial con uh, their financial situation. So we want to give them access to retirement calculators. Um, you know, the premise of the course again is similar to exactly what we've talked about: keep costs low, keep it simple, stay the course. Um, you know, we want to help people understand how to, um, you know, kind of start imagining what that, what that nest egg looks like, the, the principles, how to get there. We talk about um, the different types of retirement plans that are available to them, whether it be, you know, um, for early investors, a lot of times it's just starting with a simple IRA plan. And then they may, their office may decide to do a simple plan and then move to a 401k. I can show them examples of different, um, of different options out there between, you know, what you can get at the Edward Jones versus what we um, do in my practice or what the ADA recommends. Um, we talk about tax efficiency of portfolios and, and, and how, you know, and how to, um, as a dentist and owning a dental office or, be, you know, um, how to maximize your dental engine to help you manage your, your retirement, um, you know, the, the accumulation of your nest egg. So. 
And you also teach at the Panky Institute. I do. Man, I do. that's a prestigious gig to apply. Uh, I mean, I mean to get that. I mean that that's. I mean that's the world class, preeminent institution. How, how did you get that gig? Did you have to? How, how did you get that? And and how often do you teach there? Um, no, no, seriously. Howard, congratulations on that, dude. That that's a. Oh, thank you. Um, my, uh, my colleague no. up the street here in Phoenix, Leanne Brady, teaches there. I went through all six weeks of the Pink Institute. Uh, I went there for six weeks, Key Biscayne, Florida. I hope uh, Irma. You're Hurricane Andrew. I hope your twin sister, I, uh, Irma, doesn't uh, water surge flood them because they are on the ocean. I used to take yeah, my four they, boys they, they, with me. In fact, my boys used to ask me, when are you going back to the Panky Institute? What was that yeah. hotel across the street from it? What was the name of that one? Uh, the big, tall one, the, the nicest one. Well, on the... the uh, you, well, year, years ago, it, it um, you know, right on Crandon Boulevard, it was the, um, oh, I can't remember. You know, now it's all, you know, the Ritz-Carlton and the, there's there's all kinds of fancier. Oh, my God. Uh, you know, we're in stuff. Phoenix, which is a desert. You key, know. key Colony, Key Colony was the condos that was that was across the street when I went there. And then the new the new institute was built around 2000, I think. Um, oh, my God. Uh, uh, the, the boys, you know, Phoenix is a desert. And uh, I'd go there for a week. It'd be Monday through Friday, and they they just cried when they had to go home. They just they just loved sitting on that beach playing. My dad was in there learning. But anyway, so so how often do you teach down there, and what's the course called, and and how do you get in on that? Well, the um, you know the the teaching that I do at the institute is in in most of the times that I've been there, it's usually one or two times a year, and um, the the uh, I'll, I'll be teaching with uh, Dr. Brady. Uh, I think in April of next year. Um, but the coursework is, is just um, for students that are coming into the initial curriculum. The coursework is just around all the basic stuff that we've talked about today, helping people understand compound interest, helping people understand the cost of capital, um, really simple um, financial uh, principles that, that, um, that can be built on over a period of years. And um, so there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing complicated about it, Howard. It's just, um, I like to go and be able to share information of the things that I have gleaned over the years, the times that I have stubbed my toe. Um, those types of stories are what uh, dentists need to hear about. They need to hear that, um, not that, that, um, that any person that stands up at the podium is perfect, it's about all the times that we have stumbled along the way and things that we've learned from it. I mean, the, the, the time I went to the financial advisor and the advisor told me that, um, you know, I should be involved in a whole life policy. And, and the good news was I only did that for one year and realized that the cash value of my $10,000 policy was only 5,000 bucks. So, um, you know, it's, there's there's uh, there's lots of good and simple information out there, and that's what I want to pass on. So, you know that is uh, so true. Um, how you learn from your mistakes is always the best. I mean, the best book I've read lately was uh, Mish's last book, Avoiding Complications of Oral Implantology. You learn more yes. from reading 800 pages of every of damn mistakes. implant that failed. That's how you learn, not by yes. learning. 800 pages of how to place an implant. I mean, God, you're drilling a hole in bone. I get that. Show me 800 pages of everything yes. that failed. It was also my favorite uh, business person um, who, was, who wrote Good to Great, uh, um, Jim Collins. Uh, you know, yes. He wrote, he wrote yes. uh, Built to Last, Good to Great, but yes. my most mind-blowing book from him was The Opposite. He decided, why am I always talking about how the good ones get great? Why don't I talk about how the great ones go bust? And he wrote a book called How the Mighty Fail. And it was the yes. shortest book. It was the most yes. succinct, succise. And it was just like, you read that, it's like, okay, you know what you shouldn't do. It's like, you know, when, when you go to McDonald's and she says, would you like cheese on that? She shouldn't even ask you. you. You know what the answer is. So you say, actually make it a double cheeseburger. Uh, so <laughs> you, you know what to do. You just don't do it. You know, Dental Town has 50 categories, root canals, fillings, crowns, whatever. But one of them is finance. And under finance yeah. is accounting, bookkeeping, uh, equipment acquisition, practice management, financing, one's patient finance plans, 
but one's personal finance and one's taxes. And it, it is it is a very, very uh, robust deal. I mean, you. I think that um, the student loan debt, the dentist living beyond their means, um, you know, a lot of, um, but th- they're just, it's amazing how you can have eight years of college. And in my opinion, you can still be pretty crazy. Like, like a lot of dentists, like, like, what do you think about Bitcoin? There, there's a lot of dentists on, uh, on dental town that think that's the next big thing. Do you, do you have, do you, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin? Um, you know, um, Howard, I, I am, there are, um, you know, they talk about the curve with, there are laggards, and then there are early adopters and then late adopters. And, and um, I'm just a conservative investor. If I was going to invest in Bitcoin, I would say, OK, I'll take 5% of my investing portfolio and I'll put it in Bitcoin because that's speculative. I'm not going to speculate with anything more than 5%. So um, I, I could be um, way off in 20 years from now, people may say, boy, I wish, you know, Mark would have suggested that I invested in Bitcoin. But, you know, those types of speculative things, I, I'm I'm all for it. I have my eye on a target 20 years from now, Howard, and Bitcoin is not going to, in my portfolio right now, it's zero. But things that are speculative to me, I just, I'm not, I wouldn't go beyond 5%. Okay, so, but here, I'm concerned. here's concerned. the most here's the most asked talked about question under finance and industry. How would you answer that? She says, I got out of school when I was 25. I I, I practiced as an associate for three or four years, and I'm gonna set up my practice. And when I, when it all gets open, I'll be 30 and I'll probably practice till she's 60 or 65. Um, should she rent or own? Is is buying the land and building? I mean, you're talking about stocks and bonds and saving money in a 401k index fund. But what about real estate? Because she okay, has so, so so are, talk- and are you talking are you talking real estate to live in or real estate to run your business in? The dental office. Okay. Should so, she rent um, her dental office for 30 years or should she buy the land and building? Because it's a big chunk of change. She's already 350 in debt. She's bought a practice for 750. And the owner's saying, well, do you want the building too? It's another five. I mean, she's like, right. Jiminy Christmas. Okay, so <laughs> I can only do this. I can only do this. I can only share two stories that I have. Okay. okay. So um, my first story is um, that I bought the first building that my dental office was in. in um, so I bought the business in 2000. Uh, in 2000, I bought the building five years later in 2005. Okay. It was the absolute height of the real estate market. And within two years, that building lost 50% of its value. Nice. Okay? What, what was that in North Carolina? I, no, this was in Minnesota. I've been in North Carolina for six years. How come you don't okay? talk like a Minnesotan? Um, just ask me to say boat <laughs> or uh, Minnesota. <laughs> uh, but I, that investment in real estate, I lost about 50% on that. Okay, so um, my you're talking to someone who is likely never going to make any money on real estate. Okay, now I bought the dental building that I'm in down here in North Carolina. Um, I think I bought at the bottom of the market on this one. So that's my hope for. Um, So, you know, it's interesting. um, Real estate, again, can be part of a portfolio. It's just not going to be more than 50% of my portfolio. So if, if I don't have any money, I'm probably not going to be buying a building. Um, if I'm a new dentist, um, I, would, I would think about um, renting first. But, you know, every person's um, history and every person's willingness to, to um, risk is going to be different. And so, I, you know, I, it's interesting – that um, one of my mentors once told me that Dr. Pankey never believed in buying uh, dental real estate. Now, he happened to own some of the real estate that he had his dental practice in, but what he would tell most dentists was, don't buy the real estate. So, and I also I want to say something else. You know, you, you've quoted some amazing people. I mean, we're, we're talking about uh, Warren Buffett, and we're talking about Charlie Munger, and, uh, and uh, who were the ones you quoted earlier? Um, well, John, John Bogle from Vanguard, the founder right. of Vanguard, yeah. um, William Bernstein, w- William Bernstein, actually, um, he has a free book out there that it takes about 30 minutes to read it. It's called If You Can, you can you can Google it. 
Um, and that's what the that's what the 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 five hurdles that I shared today are all based upon his simple little book. And what, um, what, what, what's, what's that guy's name? Uh, William Bernstein, B E R S T E I N. The book title is If You Can. So what's the opposite of uh, John Bogle, William Bernstein, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger? You know, you see these people under financing uh, talking about things like, oh, uh, I just read that legendary investor Jim Rogers uh, said we're ready for the biggest market crash of all time. And then a five-second Google search shows that he said that in 2011, 2012, yes. 2013, yes. 2000. Yes. Okay, so 2011, uh, chance of crisis worse than uh, um, 2012. It's going to get really bad after the next election, 2013. You better run for the hills, 2014. Sell everything and run for your lives, 2015. We're overdue for a stock market crash, 2016. Uh, $68 trillion biblical crash, uh, 2017. The bottom line... Uh, expect the worst crash. A broken clock is worth twice and, a day. And, and people, some people are paying for that advice, Howard. Some I people know. are paying for that advice. Um, I and I, I, but um, I guess you asked for another opposite. I always think of uh, Jim Cramer's Mad Money thing. I mean, his you know thought process on on index funds and stuff is, oh, you should have a stock portfolio, and I'll tell you what to buy and. And um, you call into my show and I'll tell you whether it's a good buy or a bad buy or whatever it is. I, you know, again, the people that I read and the people that I respect and the mentors that I have say, block out the noise, keep right. costs low, keep right. it simple, stay the course. I, I love that guy and I love that show because, you know, he, he's a bold guy and I, I got to support all the old fat bold guys. <laughs> but I, I look at those shows as entertainment because – I, I'm not because you know he's bringing up a stock. You know he he was on the conference call. Um, you know his interviews. They probably paid to get on. I mean, I just watched the interview with the CEO of Invisalign was on his show, and when dental companies, um, um Stan Bergman, the CEO, shines on the show. Uh, but uh, I don't see that as journalism. I see it as more as uh, just 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 entertainment. But when you have legends like Warren Buffett, you know, and Charlie Munger, and, and you have these legends. Uh, it's like people just, they, they, they search Google and Facebook until they find someone crazy enough to say what they actually believe. So it's kind of like when you're getting advice, I mean, you know, uh, you know, when you're in college, you know, if you ask Eddie, gosh, should I stay in and study tonight or should I go out and get crazy? You know, Eddie's going <laughs> to say, oh, come on, I'll go with you. And you know, what I did is I, I modeled. So when I was at Creighton, First day of school, there was 88 guys on the on the ninth floor of Swanson, and I sat there and I thought, okay, the smartest decision you could do is just make friends with the ones that you know, no questions asked, they're going to get into dental school. And don't start hanging out with people who you know are never going to make it into dental school, med school, law school. And I chose um, Gary Asaldi, Randy Kerwin, um, um, John Lees. G guess who... Guess what they are all today? They're all dentists. And yeah. it was funny because some of my friends who I knew that, you know, I was here to get into dental school. And some of my friends said, they're, come on, there's a big party, there's a big party, there's a big party, and I'd want to go. So I'd run down the hall and say, Randy, Gary, do you, are you guys going to go to that party? And then, you know, hell no, we have a biochemistry test Monday, you idiot. So I'm like, ah, oh, I'd be all sad because I already had committed yeah. That I was going to follow yeah. their advice. So you had you had mentors, you had mentors even in dental school. Uh, oh, absolutely! Because you 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 have to model the success of when, when you got Warren Buffett, and and I always think it's he just had a uh, he just had a show on HBO. You know, someone followed him around for an hour, and it was a on HBO. And I watched that. I mean, I've met him. I've done all that stuff. Uh, but it's just amazing how old he is, and he's still living in that little house. And his wife gives him an uh, envelope with $3, and every morning he drives through the drive to a McDonald's and just gets whatever his $3 can buy. I mean, <laughs> he's, just, he's just one uh, well, badass it, cool. There was, there was an interesting interview with um, recently. It was in the um, AARP magazine. I had to flesh it out from a uh, neighborhood retirement community. But, but um, Jack Bogle, again, from, from Vanguard, was interviewed, and, and – you know, his, he is the only investment company that's investor owned. So he does not own um, uh, personal stock in that, in that, in Vanguard. And they estimated that his, 
worth if he had done it would be $28 billion. And they said, what do you think of that? And he says, I've got all that I need to live off of right now. Isn't that cool? And, and what I used to love growing up in Kansas, there was, uh, you know, when I grew up in Kansas, there's all these older guys that grew up during the Depression. You know, when I was a little kid, you know, half the grandparents and everything lived the Depression. And even the ones that made it, and I mean made bank and had $3 million in their in their savings account, they wouldn't go to a restaurant. And if you ever did, you drag them, it was the first communion, it was some event or whatever, they'd be sitting there at the at the menu saying, $12 for a steak? We could go to Dylan's and buy a steak for three dollars. Why are we sitting here? And it's like, look, look, you know, someone and some young one younger from the next area say, Look, I'm gonna pay the bill. Just don't look at the prices. Just eat the damn steak. We're here, it's a family, but they're just they're old school, man. And 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 another thing I picked up on those guys, they didn't wear blue jeans. Because back through the depression, it was, when blue jeans came out, it was for the poor. That was a poor man's pants. And the upper class were plaid plants. So then here it was, you know, a gazillion years later, and these millionaires are walking around in plaid pants, and, you know, everybody else is looking at them like, God dang, can, don't you have enough money for a pair of pants? But in his walnut brain, he was looking at you in blue jeans thinking, oh, you are you must be poor wearing blue jeans. I'm the rich guy here wearing plaid pants. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's and it's like the guy they interviewed in uh, in uh, the Millionaire Next Door, and they asked him, you know, what kind of beer do you drink? And he says, I drink two kinds of beer, free or Budweiser. Those are the those are the. Uh, <laughs> well, man, that was the we, fastest hour ever. We went over. Uh, I want to tell you, uh, thank you so much uh, for oh, coming Howard, on my, my show. Uh, I, I know my homies; they they just love dentistry. They just want to learn bleaching, bonding, veneers. They just want to learn Invisalign. And they if they wanted to learn everything you're talking about, they wouldn't have been dentists. They would have been business majors, MBAs. They'd be in banking, finance. They'd be working at Edward Jones. Uh, but this is, uh, it's really tough to teach someone something they're not interested in. And if you don't get interested in the business of dentistry, money, banking, insurance, financing, I don't care what your trade is. I don't care if you own an Italian restaurant or a dental office. Life's going to be much harder. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll plug one book for dentists the dentist could read. It's called Bog Boglehead's Guide to Investing. Nice. Okay? And, the, and the book isn't written. It's The foreword is by John Bogle, but the book is written by kind of three of his uh, disciples who are just average people. And um, But if, if dentists want a book that they could read in – you know, five hours and really get um, some concrete financial principles, it's probably the best, simplest book out there. So could, did you find that? John C. Bogle, it's called The Bogleheads? Bo Bogleheads Guide to Investing. Nice. I have not, I have not seen that book. I will actually read that myself. Yeah, it's fant It's simple and it's fantastic. And um and anybody, it would be required reading if I was teaching finance in a dental school. So, And, and another thing, if you're not a book reader, because some people, you know, it's hard to take a wild yeah. animal. I mean, imagine taking yeah. a chimpanzee or an orangutan or a baboon and say, sit in this chair for five hours. I mean, we're not, we're not born to do that. But um, my gosh, um, if you're not a book reader, check out audio books. I mean, gosh darn. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Fantastic. I know people that, that, you know, they do all their chores Saturday morning. They clean the house, clean, you know, do all the laundry, everything for four hours. And, and my, my friend, uh, Lewis core isn't like a 10 time Iron Man. And whenever he has to go on his four five, six hour bike, I know you're a cyclist too. Every time he goes yeah. on a six hour bike ride, he, he kills another book. I mean, the guy's one right. of the most well-read guy dentist I know. And it's all done while he's cycling for training for an Ironman. So if you can't sit down and read a monk, a book, because you're a homo sapien and that's what you would expect, try audiobooks. And Amazon is reporting now they're selling more audiobooks than they are hardcovers. Have you heard that? Yeah, and that's why I listen to your podcast, Howard, because I can do that while I'm doing dishes. I can do that while I'm doing laundry or washing the car or something like that. So I, exactly. I, I kill two exactly. birds with I get killed two birds with one stone. So just don't get killed on that bike. I uh, I, I try and be very careful. So okay, well, buddy, thank you so much for coming on my show. Thanks for giving me the heads up on the next book I'm going to read. I will uh, I will get that book on uh, BarnesandNoble.com. 
Uh, I used to uh, always plug Amazon.com, but I mean, I, I, I have a book on uh, on Amazon.com, and I have one on Barnes & Noble, and Barnes & Noble is just an easy, straightforward deal. Amazon's batshit crazy. <laughs> my God, they changed the price. The, everything about ordering my simple, stupid book on Amazon is a, always a cluster. Barnes & Noble is like dealing with another dentist. And Amazon is like dealing with a crack whore behind the dumpster at KFC. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm serious. I mean, it's just crazy. I mean, I can't believe how successful Amazon is because I only have one experience with them. And that is, uh, my God, it's crazy. So, Jeff Bezos, I hope you hear this. Just Jeff Bezos, just listening. look into just one sure. customer listening, trying to sell a book. It's crazy. I'm Barnes well, and Noble. Gets- Barnes & Noble is how your dad would run his own business. Amazon.com is like some drunk casino blackjack dealer. Crazy. But I, I'll order that book on Barnes & Noble today. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I hope you have a rocking hot day. Thanks, Howard. You, you have a great day as well.